Hello, it's Derek Arden and welcome to Monday Night Live. We've got a very interesting session now on fraud, deception and lies. I myself have been uh, very involved in uh, deception and fraud and lies and recovering money off for the various companies that I work for, um, handling crooks, sussing out crooks, teaching how to spot liars. And in fact, one of my clients has asked me on Thursday to spend a session with him and his executive team. They're in the construction industry. Um, working through how they deal with people that are lying to them and they know they're lying. And uh, he says, I'd really want to just call them a barefaced liar. But I said, no, I don't think that's a good idea to do that, Dave. I think we can work on a different way of handling that. So uh, all good fun. And I've got a little presentation on a very interesting case that some of you know about. Uh, and I'm just putting my slide deck back up. Godfrey, is that slide deck back up? I think it is. Yeah, that's brilliant. Yes. Okay, so I've called it large scale fraud, false mess representation, what it's often called in the business and financial world. Financial fraud is at an all time record. And the question that Godfrey and I discussed last night, and we'll put it to you, is who makes the best liar? So this book, Best Bad Blood, The Secrets and Lies in a Silicon Valley Startup, was recommended to me. The um, the Sky program or the uh, Murdoch program on uh, on this is uh, you can get it on on your on your TV. It's very interesting. And when I picked the book up, I couldn't put it down. It was absolutely fascinating what's happened. So I'm going to walk you through some of the issues with bad blood and the lady who ran the company, Elizabeth Holmes, who was convicted last week in a Californian court of uh, wire fraud. I don't know what wire fraud is, but Tim will tell me later on or tell us all later on, I'm sure. So what did Theranos do? Well, Theranos made this piece of kit, which was installed in all sorts of uh, chemist shops all over, all over the uh, America. And uh, it was supposed to analyze blood and give an immediate result on all sorts of diseases. The big issue was it didn't work, but Elizabeth Holmes got herself on the front of Fortune magazine. She got herself in all the press. She, she went to the White House. She was seen with all sorts of presidents, et cetera, et cetera. And it all turned out to be a fraud or smoke and mirrors. And that was the problem. Now, the interesting thing about Elizabeth Holmes is, was how she did it. And you'll see her here in, in a chemist and with her lab coats on, and she was very young. She started doing this at 19. She was 37 when she was convicted last week. And um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about it. At one stage, Theranos was valued at almost $10 billion. Walgreen, the largest chemist in the US, uh, invested $140 million and sold the blood tests in its stores. Allegedly, uh, it did 100 hours of due diligence checking all the numbers yet the machine didn't work properly. They didn't actually check, no one actually got at the machine and checked it because she was so careful in who she would let to look at it. Um, um, no one saw it, which is unbelievable. Whistleblowers got fired and threatened with legal action. One of them committed suicide. So this is pretty serious stuff. They used the most expensive law firm in New York City, um, but had to give them 4.5 million Dollars. A few typos on this. I do apologize. Shares as payment. I did this about two hours ago. The two owners lived together in secret and spied on the staff. Confidentiality. Different departments were not allowed to talk to each other. Everyone had to sign a confidentiality agreement and people weren't allowed to mention to even talk to their families about it. And they would get sued like crazy if they did. They also made the employees reliant on the job by overpaying them, which is uh, often a tactic of this type of company. So then people spend over their means and therefore can't get another job at the end of it. The negotiation tactics that were used uh, were number one, time pressure to seal the deal. If you don't uh, do the deal, and this happened to Walgreens, 
um, someone else will. We've got someone else on standby because this is a typical uh, negotiation tactic that's used all around the world. And you've really got to suss out whether people are telling you the truth or not. And then we come to uh, FOMO, that famous FOMO, fear of missing out, which of course is one of those things that uh, gets people to sign up against sometimes their intuition, but worried about they might miss out. Using another Robert Giordini uh, expression, social proof, they lied quite a bit. They said the US government had signed up for uh, a number of, uh, of these processes when actually they hadn't. When people asked difficult questions, they withheld information and uh, they didn't uh, send it uh, even after a month or two. And people were then under time pressure and took a chance. Uh, they were uncontactable for queries, but when they were pitching the product, they were always there. They threatened people who disagree. Now, here's an interesting bit, as you can probably tell that uh, male investors, and it was virtually every investor was male, pale and stale, as people say. They were older, older men who were smitten by Elizabeth and her, sto uh, her, her story. The other interesting thing she was very wary about from women. So when women started asking questions and digging, she um, pushed them off and uh, didn't follow it up. It was much easier to deal with men. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, Elizabeth uh, a few weeks ago at her trial. Notice how she plays the hair card to the jury as well. She was up to, as I saw it, every uh, negotiation tactic and trick that uh, she could. In fact, she wasn't convicted on all the 10 accounts. I think she was convicted on four of them. It would be interesting to see what happens next. And I know Tim's got a view on that uh, later. So what about Elizabeth? She was mesmerizing, intoxicating, likable, attractive, and very ruthless. She fired people that tried to blew the whistle almost within a minute. She had a hypnotic voice. Watch the video. She's got a very deep voice and I don't know how she does it. She's obviously had a voice coach. She's deepened her voice to give her more authority. Exactly what uh, Margaret Thatcher did in the 80s in the UK. Hypnotic eyes described as piercing eyes, blue eyes, uh, perhaps even with dilated pupils to make her look even more um, likable. Didn't blink. They stared at you with these huge blue eyes. And she dressed in black like Steve Jobs. Her ambition was to be the next Apple. That's, uh, that's, what, um, that's what came out of it. Moving on. Uh, Rupert Murdoch invested $125 million. The Devos family, I believe they own Walgreens, uh, the chemist supermarket, invested $100 million. General James Mattis, who became the Secretary of State for Defence under Donald Trump, invested a watch. And Henry Kissinger invested money. You can see a trend here. They're all older men. Some of these people, and I don't know which ones, became non-exec directors. This gave total credibility to... Uh, to uh, and Theranos, even though no one had actually checked, did the machine work? And I'll ask Godfrey a few questions about the questions that we should ask uh, digging down in a minute. So I'm gonna put you very quickly into, uh, into um, breakout rooms. And here are the three questions. And when you get into the breakout rooms, you can deal with whichever question you like. I really don't mind. What are the patterns of this type of large fraud? I know we've got some accountants and lawyers in the audience, so uh, you will have seen something like this. Has anyone had experience of this type of situation, like I have, like Godfrey has uh, when we were in banking and uh, even now? And who makes the best liar? And what are the clues? So they're the three questions. If you could remember them when you go into the breakout rooms for seven minutes or just pick one, discuss it. Let's see what comes out of it, because there's always so much comes out of uh, the breakout groups on Monday Night Live. So I'm just going to move to the breakouts, open the breakout rooms, press the button, and I'll see you back in seven minutes. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, great sessions in the breakout rooms. Let's, um, let's go to breakout room number one and see uh, what they came up with. Who was breakout group number one? I think that was us. 
Paul. Okay, Alex, Amy, go for it. His... <laughs> oh, well, we had a really interesting discussion on the patterns of the type of fraud. We also did a bit of due diligence. We feel that we've probably done more due diligence than those who invested in her might have done. Uh, there was talk about her being a dropout from university, and we actually realised that the university was Stanford which is interesting. And Alex found that her father was a, had worked in Enron and we all know at the fallout oh, wow. of Enron. So interesting there. There was a lot of talk about her being very dominant and beyond reproach and having that incredible, credible, incredible, believable charm. And she was capable of being evasive on detail because of her partner who was the more advanced and with the knowledge and the medical side. So that's as much as I can offer. Anybody else from our room want to add on to that? Alex, okay, Alex uh, you're on mute. Okay, is there anyone there? Yeah, Alex. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think there has to be a little bit of a degree of plausibility in the thing that they're selling, uh, but it's at the edge of plausibility. You know, you know it doesn't take you um, too far to tip it one way that you want to believe it. Actually, if you watch, I was watching the Sky video last night, just still doing a little bit of prep for it. And uh, I turned it off halfway through because she looks totally plausible on the video. And these are videos that they made and they were, you know, I was, almost thought she was someone like Tony Robbins. I really did. And it really looks plausible. So take a look at the video. And, uh, you know, it's, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But uh, the Walgreens to invest that sort of money and set up booths in their shops. Um, I wonder if I wonder who might be being uh, being sued for that. So yeah, interesting. Very quickly, Derek, if I may, Alex made a very good point where we spoke about due diligence. We know the people who actually invested, but what we don't know is how many people potentially invested and had done their due diligence and simply disappeared off, and therefore we don't know that scale. No, I'm not. I'm not sure. She obviously wanted big investors. She needed loads of money. There were 800 people employed at uh, at their head headquarters in uh, Palo Alto. If that's uh, if that's how you present. In it. terms of the due diligence, uh, um, Derek, little point. We did talk a lot about that, but let's remember that they were the start of the investment, and it wouldn't have been all right if Walgreens were 100 million. It wouldn't have been 100 million in in, the, in one go. They would, they would get suckered in, wouldn't they, with 10 million, 20 million, oh, we need a bit more, we need a bit more, we need a bit yeah. more, and they're getting to the space. And then very much, from what I've read in the book, is it was all about, well, you can't miss out. You know, look, we, we're in so far, we've got to spend a bit more money to support this because that will get the return. Uh, and, and, uh, and, and I think she was very skillful at that. We're I'm just on the edge of it. We're just almost there. Uh, Derek, if I can add something as well, uh, Walgreens net worth is, is around about $100 billion. So actually $140 million is relatively small change, I'm afraid. Yeah. So yeah. maybe it didn't get the attention it should have done because it was just, um, you know, as Paul said, it was maybe a creeping commitment. And it's not, not huge bucks in terms of a company that size. It was positioned as the next Apple. She was positioning it as the next Apple. And if you think about it, her yeah. black costumes she had about 25 black costumes they're all the same hanging up in her wardrobe they showed that so she was you know emulating Steve Jobs and I think she believed it she believed it would work um, and that happens in a lot of those sort of situations till it doesn't work and then you find out the books have been been cooked uh, which group wants to go next How about number four uh, well we've got Godfrey and Tim waving that's great and Paul scratching his head yeah. Go free. Uh, yeah, uh, I was with um, Christine and uh, Andrew. Um, we actually used it as a, a template for generic fraud. And then we moved on to who makes good liars. But um, we came up collectively with the fact that, certainly in my experience as well, a great many entrepreneurs and new startups, they want that first good blue chip client and if they can sell themselves and get a good well-known name on board the risk is that other people coming on behind look at the name and don't do their own due diligence so they rely on that first name and so on and so on and that's twofold one is to attract investment the other is for brand awareness and marketing just to get the name out there 
So there is a risk that if you don't dig behind at the beginning, other people just look at the big well-known blue chip names. So we, we did talk about that. And then we moved on to um, we'll share some experience. And um, uh, I'll invite Christine in a minute to um, come back and share a little personal experience with her family, which I thought was reassuring, actually, which is the other side of stuff. Um, but we talked about um, who makes the best liars. Um, and um, we almost got across purposes because I said, well, um, what, does a, what does a liar look like? Well, it could be any of us. Um, but in my experience, the more intelligent you are, perhaps the better educated you are, uh, it's a little bit easier to lie and be aware of the body language that Derek would preach to us all and therefore be able to counter it, look you straight in the eye and have the memory, we said, to uh, remember what you said, because liars often trip themselves up uh, further down the, the investigation they go. Um, but then, Christine, come at, please come in, because you raised a question that I haven't explored enough, which is, do men or women make the best liars? Do you want to go, Christine? Um, well, I have no, no data or anything. I just speculated that... Um, uh, men were more likely to be fraudsters than women, but um, it wasn't really based on anything. I was just throwing it into the mix, <laughs> and uh, I don't know whether it's anything that anybody else had um, considered. I think well, you, might... did, you did back it up by saying, in your experience, when you were dealing with the court service, I think in Scotland, um, out of sixteen prisons, there was only one for women. <laughs> um, we could. Um, we but that, that's, that tends to be sort of um, a mixture of morality, responsibility, failing to see consequences of your actions, all sorts of things. Um, um, so, but I mean, I'm not, I don't have sufficient experience of fraud. And Women don't get caught. Yeah, well, I did say that even if, even for those people who say women don't get, <coughs> caught, don't get long enough sentence, the similar length sentences, even so, that's disproportionate, yeah? But anyway, um, but the good news story that Godfrey mentioned was yeah. my dad, who's just turned 93, was on the phone to the bank, was having difficulty in uh, remembering um, the, the, uh, the number that had been given and sought the assistance of uh, the guy who repairs his computer, who happened to be in the room, who's a bit gruff. And the woman said, if there's somebody else there, I can't speak to you over the phone, the woman at the bank. And um, the computer man got even gruffer and said, oh, I don't know why not and what have you, you know. And, um, and then she said to my dad, are you being threatened and, and what have you? And he said, no, no, it's fine. It's, you know, um, Keith down the road. Um, anyway, and she said she would have to phone him back later or an another day about this matter. But actually, um, within an hour of putting the phone down, given that this is rural Cumbria, um, there was a policewoman knocking on the door just to make sure that he was OK, which I thought was quite impressive. Obviously, they'd have his date of birth. Um, but I mean, cops don't get out and around Cumbria that quickly generally. So it was quite impressive. <laughs> I, I thought that was very reassuring and well done the bank for doing that. The co-op co bank. Well, well done the co-op. <laughs> yeah. Well, those of us that work for one or two banks probably uh, think they wouldn't have done it. Just for um, everybody's information that doesn't know, Godfrey was a, a private detective for over 20 years, so he's got a lot of experience in that. And uh, John Lisby uh, ran a huge uh, accountancy practice for a number of years. So we've got uh, quite some experts on here. So thanks for the input and uh, thanks for that, Christine. That's, uh, that was um, that sounds fabulous. I'm sure we got some fraud, personal fraud stories to tell each other at some stage. But let's stick to the corporate stuff for now. Um, who wants to go next? Who's got uh, Tim Durkin? And then it looked like Nigel Kirby, but it may be just rubbing his nose. Um, I was watching the body language carefully. Well, I had the pleasure of sharing the room with Michael O'Hara. And uh, we discovered that the best way to detect it is, well, number one, to make to under uh, th that it would be an outlandish claim. Like Thorano said, one drop will screen for hundreds of different maladies. Um, so the more outlandish, the more likely it is to be believed. 
Um, there's a, a lot to be said for force of personality. She practiced the force of personality, but other people who have traded on the force of personality are Donald Trump, Elon Musk continues to do it with his unprofitable car company, um, if you take away government funding. Um, and, and so there's a great deal of force of personality that she exhibited. And the key in her case, I believe, part of the key was timing. Walgreens invested because the drug store, uh, I think you called a pharmacy, um, was in big competition with another drugstore called CVS. And they are moving out of just selling prescriptions and selling medical services in the states so that you can go to a Walgreens or a CVS to see a doctor or someone similar to a doctor. And so Walgreens saw this as a very big competitive advantage over CV CVS. And so her timing was very, very strong on that. Um, Michael did have a personal experience and um, just a little bit too raw to share uh, at, at this point. Um, but uh, it's, he's not necessarily clear of it yet. But uh, we had a great, great discussion. And I highly recommend the book, by the way. Uh, one of the best books I've read in a very, very long time. Thanks, Tim. And um, who's next? One more before I stop the recording and then we'll throw it open after the recording. So, so who's got their hand up? Who wants to say it? Uh, yeah. Yes, please, Mike. Um, our, our group, um, we, we took a slightly different angle um, because, uh, apologies, I think it was Lynn threw in the word psychopath. Mm. Um, and then we did some digging around what the definition of a psychopath was and how that worked and just their ability, their charisma, their focus, all the traits that we're describing that you have to have to be able to make a fraud stick um, and their ability to see that through. And then the contrast of that is the, uh, uh, some of you were talking about due diligence before, but that's, then that's down to the emotion and the, uh, the, the way that they get caught up, the investors, um, because of the names of other people there. Well, it must be okay because Bob's in there, so I'll throw some more money in as well. Uh, so that means that sort of feeds off the one. So you've got this psychopathic, narcissistic individual who believes what they say and is incredibly convincing in how they come across and what they're doing uh, with no remorse and, and no scruples. And then you've got others who are wanting to get involved in the, the next biggest thing on the planet that's going to change the world and they want their legacy there they want their life uh, they, they want a statue built to their ego um so hence they're jumping on board to get involved so it was, it was a um a combination of all uh, yeah i'm sure there was a lot more janice had, uh, you you had plenty to say as well and and if it was gone off at the moment <laughs> trying to cover without sort of speaking for everybody else you're doing a great job, Mike. Um, Janice, do you want to come in? You're closer. To, you're closer to this than we are. I just wanted to. I, I was. Well, we did get to the whole psychopath thing, which is, I find very interesting. But I wanted to know what the underlying motivation was and how she got into this and why these brilliant investors didn't do the correct due diligence in the first place and why they were so motivated. Well, I can see why they'd be motivated to jump on her bandwagon like um, Tim was talking about Walgreens. That made a lot of sense to me. But the original investors, the angel type investors, I, I would think they do really rigid due diligence. So I just, maybe she faked her books and maybe she faked at the very beginning was just faking everything. I'm not really sure, but what was, I don't know. I, I just think, it's, it's so frustrating to me that this even happened. Yeah, I'll try and answer that very quickly with one or two things I read in the book. Number one was um, there's a lot of money sloshing around to get into these startups. Yeah. Um, I understand in California, even more money. So people didn't want to miss out. It was the fear of missing out. So she sold it, right. you know, through Robert Giordini's influencing strategy. She was liked. Um, she was charming. Um, she targeted the older male investors um, with Walgreens. Definitely, she said, we're about to sign with your competition, which is the one that Tim said she was believable. Um, and she was attractive to the grandfather 
type of male. I think she played on that big time. And it's very interesting, Janice, that when someone like you turned up and asked a few questions, um, a woman, she didn't answer them. She just um, got rid of you. Oh, we don't want your money or something. So that's how she, that's how she played it. So, but um, yeah, I read, I don't know if it's true in the Financial Times a few weeks ago that uh, one in five chief executives are psychopaths. Now, someone said they're probably social, sociopaths. I didn't really know the difference between the two. A sociopath but... is a murderer. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm going to look it up really quick. Yeah, it was this, um, um, you'll do as I say. I've got no emotions. I don't care about you. Um, let's yeah. just get, get this done. And she did that because she didn't care. She didn't care yeah. about the guy that killed himself, who was the whistleblower, and he was so stressed up about it. She, she didn't, she... She didn't even call his wife, etc. So, yeah. so yeah, there we are. Sociopaths or psychopaths are not necessarily violent. Um, oh. They're actually your traditional con man. Yeah. Uh huh. Somebody okay. Interesting in the chat. Yeah, we'll we'll save the chat box. Um, one last, one last short comment before we close the uh, recording and then, uh, then we'll stay on. I think what is interesting, speaking of the grandfather effect, um, one of the people not mentioned as her early backer financially and emotionally was former United States Secretary of State, uh, George Shultz. It was his grandson who worked with Theranos that started to blow the whistle told his grandfather about it, his grandfather still being so enamored with Elizabeth, almost broke relationships permanently with his beloved grandson over um, the fact that George Schultz, the senior, um, believed her. And it's, it's just an amazing story of how many brilliant people were fooled. Uh, it's a, it's a, again, I highly recommend the book for a lot of reasons. And the last thing I was going to say on that, guys, was I have been uh, in banking situations where smaller banks, all they wanted to know on the credit risk was Barclays and NatWest in because they assumed we must have done due diligence uh, all over all over the credit. And that was a pretty wild assumption when we got one or two things wrong or I had to pick it up on behalf of a branch who, who'd messed it up. And when we looked at it, no one really had uh, done due diligence at all. Uh, yeah, but everybody there, there, assumed we, the massive big player had. Uh, in our group, Derek, we did say that um, in many, many cases, it's just looking for that first big name. And um, once you get the first big blue chip company or the first big well-known in individual on board, then the risk is that the others falling in behind don't do the same due diligence. I remember once doing a case and there were two banks lending money, neither knew about each other. I mean, it, it happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but there are big lessons here. And certainly... Uh, there may have been, and Tim will, will say yes or no, there may have been an element of, I do want to be the next Apple. I think I know a way of doing it at the beginning. But once she got so far down the track, she was hooked and then made a deliberate decision to plow on anyway. Um, so mm -hmm. one might forgive her at the age 19 when she first started with the germ of an idea, but you certainly can't forgive her two, three years later down the track. Yeah, the last thing I'd say on that, he was, um, she was quoting Edison. She called the machine Edison. Um, she'd read that Edison, um, he lied to uh, his investors two years before he actually invented the light bulb, etc. So I think she was plowing on, hoping that the 800 scientists or whatever that she was employing would, would find the answer. Last one from you, Tim, and then I'm going to close yeah. the recording down and we'll stay on. You asked me about wire fraud. She was convicted of four of 11 counts. They're all of wire fraud. Wire fraud is basically using any communication transmission via mail, telephone, telegraph, email, uh, social media to transmit false information. Uh, yes, wire fraud. Thanks for that tip on wire fraud, uh, Tim. Um, well, everybody, that's a fascinating uh, chat discussion about fraud about dishonesty um 
couple of things from me. Number one, if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Common sense. As Godfrey said to me yesterday when we were chatting about this, people didn't ask the big questions. And that's interesting, isn't it? What are the big questions? And before you go into anything, you should be asking yourself, what are the big questions? And people, when they're negotiating, say, oh, I got the deal. That was great. But they hadn't been paid. And uh, a deal's not a deal until the cash is in the bank. And uh, so thanks, everybody. And please join me next week. Uh, thanks for all your input. Thanks to the uh, experts who joined us today. And um, look forward to seeing you next week. If you're watching this on YouTube or listening to this on the podcast channel, uh, please like it and please recommend it to your friends. My name is Derek Arden. Thank you. <laughs>